Good morning. You guys are wild this morning. Good morning. You guys stay up late last night, did you? This is it. This is it. I'm excited. Here's the deal. My name's Tom, and um, I've been here for a while. <laughs> this is the, this week, I want you to listen very carefully if you're visiting. This week, starting today is we're celebrating the greatest event that ever took place in history. And if you're not, if you don't know Jesus and you're not sure what in the world's going on, I can tell you this. I don't know if you noticed it, but the world's goofed up. Yeah, anyone see that? There's a lot of stuff happening in the world. And I want to encourage you with something that God is not trying to figure things out. It's important that you and I understand something, that the, the God that created all things, He is the God that knows all things. He's omnipotent and omnipresent. What does that mean to you and I? In other words, He's not scratching His head, and it doesn't dawn on Him what's going on. Matter of fact, Everything that's going on that you see going on in the world today is a part of the unfolding of what God is doing. So I would encourage you that part of that is a celebration that we call Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter celebration. If you have never walked through this, I would invite you to hang around today and then Friday and next Sunday to understand what in the world's going on. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you today. This is a day that you have made. We're here, and it's not an accident. You're an awesome God. So what we're asking, Father, you're the God of the universe. You're the God that created us. Father, that you would breathe on us this morning, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak to our minds. Father, that we would have a revelation of who you are. So, Lord, as we look at your word today, your word's powerful. We're asking a blessing on your word. We're praying that your word would open the eyes of our hearts, that your word would do in us what's impossible for us to do. You sent your word and changed us. So, Lord, we're asking a blessing on the Word today, and we thank you for this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we're celebrating Palm Sunday, but we're baptizing people the first service and the second service, but I I believe that it's really important. We're living in a day and time when the world's trying to do away with history. They They want to do away with an understanding what has happened in the past. And the important thing about this is history is so important. If we don't understand where we came from, we really won't know where we're going. It'd be like us standing here and saying, okay, well, let's go to California. Unless you know where you are, then you can't get there from here. So as we're looking at the Word of God and understanding what in the world's going on, and as I said before, um, Everything going on was spoken by the prophets 2,000, 2,500, 2,700 years ago. Actually, Isaiah 60 says this, In the last days, behold, darkness will cover the earth. Gross darkness the people, but the Lord will shine on his people. So this gross darkness, what does this gross darkness darkness look like? This means the very things that was done in secret will be celebrated on corners. 
This means that the very things that God called sin would be called right, and the very things that is right would be called wrong. God spoke this in the book of Daniel, in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Matthew, and it's so important. So as we're looking at this, there's, God's not scratching his head trying to figure things out. And so if we know God and his word, then we're very aware of what's going on in the world. We're not scratching our heads. There is a peace that passes all understanding in the people of God. So as much as there is a God, I tell you a secret, there's a God of this world. And the God of this world is the God of darkness that would, would consume people, that would steer people into darkness, that would confuse people, that would even confuse their identities on who they are. Actually, we would think this is the first time this has ever happened. It's not. Actually, during the time of Christ, this is exactly what was going, what, what was going on. Um, when it came to um, pagan worship, um, the temples were fu full of prostitutes. And um, uh, there was all kinds of, of pagan worship, no different than today. It's just that they had some names. So when Christianity started, the world was full of what's going on now. And then when Jesus came, it dissipated. When, when Christ followers went about the world and went and preached the gospel, it was pushed out. And what happens in the last days, we see this. Because it's the last days, we see this coming back again. Because the God of this world knows his time short. But I want to look at history. History is very important. And as we're Looking at history, we, this lets us know where we are. And I want to begin to read the story, a simple story about what we call the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. Um, and it's in the book of Luke. And I'm going to begin to read. It says, it come, came to pass when he drew near to Bethany in Bethany at the mount called Olives. And he sent two disciples saying, go into the village opposite of and where you enter and you'll find a colt tied, which no man has ever set on. Lose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosening it? Uh, tell them because the master is in need of it. I want to say something to you that... 580 years before that was said, the prophet Zechariah prophesied that that very word, that, that the Messiah would come riding on a colt that had never been ridden on before. So the unfolding, actually the unfolding of Palm Sunday was something that was spoken about for 700 years, there's over 300 prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled. To give you an idea of that, in figuring seven of those prophecies, it would for him to fulfill seven of them. If he misses one, he's not Lord. But if he fulfilled seven of them, the chance factor of him fulfilling seven of them would be the same chance factor if you would cover the state of Texas with silver dollars. Mark one, blindfold Jake and him wander around in Texas and find that Mark silver dollar. Jesus fulfilled over 300. So we're not scratching our head trying to figure out if Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord whether we like it or not. And as we look at this, Jesus shows up, and, and God is a God of nanoseconds. Jesus shows up according to Galatians 4. It says that Jesus, God sent his son at the appointed time. And I want to say, he's going to come back at the appointed time. The first time he came, he came at the split second when God sent him. So, Zechariah 9.9 9, over 500 years before Jesus shows up. So Jesus goes on to say, so those who went, he sent them on their way, and they found just as he has said to them, but as they were loosening the colt, the owners of them said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said unto him, the Lord is in need of it. And they brought him to Jesus. 
And they threw their clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus upon it. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. In the book of Matthew, it says they spread palms and clothes along the road as Jesus went in. And as he drawed near, was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice, praising God in a loud voice saying, <clears throat> for almighty works that he had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory on the highest. Matthew 21 says, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And we would think, well, this is a great worship song that they're singing because of the coming king. Some of the Pharisees said, uh, Pharisees called him out of the crowd and said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them and he says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, even the stones would cry out. See, what was going on, unless we understand history, in your history books, not just in the Bible, unless we understand history, we can miss what's going on. So Jesus is writing that. Jesus has been around for 33 years. There's a rumor going around that this guy's the Messiah that he is the coming king. And there is an expectation of people that is longing for the coming of the king, but they have their way of thinking. And then the world had its way of thinking, and Jesus had his way of thinking, and they were different. What we have is two trains getting ready to, to run head in one to another. Hosanna. History. 160 or 170 BC, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. He is a Greek leader that they overthrew Jerusalem and he took them captive. And this guy's a Greek. He doesn't believe in God. He believes in Zeus and his God. So Antiochus, what he did was he stopped the temple worship. In other words, you can't go to church no more. He stopped the temple worship. And what he did was he brought a statue of Zeus and placed it in the temple. Then, then he took another step. He slaughtered hogs on the altar. What this would be was for the Jews would be the defouling of the temple of the Most High God. And so he stops the worship and they no longer worship. And some people, because it was a governmental thing and the government was calling the shots, they gave into it. And other people, they were called the Maccabees. They went to the hills and they hid and they prayed and they waited on the Lord. And eventually they were outnumbered, but eventually what they did is they came back in what was a guerrilla warfare to take the temple back. So in 167 BC, they actually overthrow Antiochus. And Antiochus Epiphanes was his name, uh, the illustrious one. The Jews called him Antiochus Abimenes, the nutcase. And so they go in and they overthrow Antiochus. And when they go back in, they go back in and they relight the menorah or the candles in the temple. This is where you get Hanukkah the celebration of the relighting of the temple. So as they went back in town, they were shouting, Hosanna. This is a war cry. This is a cry of victory overcoming the enemy. So as Jesus is riding in to town and everyone's celebrating Hosanna and the Pharisees look at them and they're telling them, see, they are, they are controlled by the Romans. And the Pharisees are telling them, unless you shut them up, you'll get us killed. And Jesus says, listen, if I shut them up, uh, these rocks would cry out. So what they want is they have a plan for Jesus. You know, sometimes you and I have a plan for Jesus. And if Jesus doesn't fit in your box and, and work your way, then maybe he's not Lord. Boy, that a preach. Um, he didn't come to fit in my ways. He came that I could fit into his ways. 
This is huge. So he came, and, and they have a plan for him. So their plan, the Romans are, 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 are controlling Jerusalem. So their plan is that Jesus is going to show up. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. He's going to do away with taxes. He's doing away with Biden. He's doing away with the Senate. He's doing away with the Congress. There's all kinds of stuff that's going to happen. And this is our plan. This is what we want Jesus to do. Because if he's really Lord of our lives, he really wants the political arena to change. And Jesus goes ahead and rides into town and he goes into the temple and he begins to turn the tables in the temple over. And so this is actually to understand during Passover, what Passover is, he's celebrating Passover. Passover is a time when they bring a lamb and this lamb is a representation of Jesus Christ. They bring a lamb without spot or blemish and they offer this lamb as a sacrifice for the sin of the people, Jesus is that lamb. So as we're celebrating this and they're riding into town, Israel as a nation is impoverished. But you have hundreds of thousands of people coming to Jerusalem. This is like Black Friday. This is where everything turns from red to black. So Josephus says there's over 250,000 lambs that is offered during Passover. So the celebration, they're thinking Jesus is coming in and overthrowing the government and all this stuff is going to happen. But what he does is he goes into the temple, he turns the tables over and he says, you guys have made my father's house a den of thieves. And as he left, all these people this week that was saying Hosanna, the following week was yelling, crucify him. Crucify him because he didn't do it the way I wanted it done. Passover. I want to go on to read, he says in verse 41. Now, as he drawed near to the city, he wept over the city, saying, If you had only known, even you, especially this day, the things that might bring you peace, this is important, the things that might bring peace you and I peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in from every side, and level you and your children within. And the ground that they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. I want to stop. This is a, the unfolding of something that God had talked about 700 years ago, 500 years ago. So the unfolding, Jesus shows up exactly, exactly when he's supposed to show up. The prophet Daniel, 585 years before Jesus shows up, was given the exact dates when Jesus would show up on the scene. So in the book of Daniel, some of you have heard of this before, Daniel was given a vision by the angel of 77s. And this is how many years, 7 times 70 is 490 years, how many years it would be before Jesus Christ showed up. So Daniel is given in the vision, he says, you'll see seven sevens, and these sevens will start, listen very carefully, these sevens will start when Jerusalem's gates and roads and trenches are rebuilt. The, they'll start when the decree goes out, there'll be seven sevens, then there'll be 62 sevens. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you and I, but what it meant was there's gonna be 49 years before the second 62 sevens. So the decree that goes out from when we're trying to figure out when Jesus is going to ride into town on Palm Sunday, this is 580 years before it happens. The de decree goes out in your history books. The decree goes out to rebuild the, the walls around Jerusalem. In 444 BC, in the month of Nisan, that is March, April. 
444 BC. What is that? So um, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah goes before the king Artaxerxes, and he asked permission to go back and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem because Jerusalem had been destroyed. And the decree goes out 444 in Nisan, 444, March, April of 444 BC. Now, if you multiply the years and the dates, the number, the 77s, what you end up with, you should write this down. Matter of fact, you should know this. It's 173,880 days from the time the decree goes out till the coming of the Messiah. So Jesus looks at them and says, if you only knew the time of your visitation, down to the nanu second when I said I'm riding in. The de decree goes out 173,880 days, and Jesus is riding into town and says, if you would have only knew the time of your visitation. But now it's hid from you. So he comes. And as he comes, he comes as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God that takes the sin of man. See, God had give them an image as they came out of Egypt of a lamb. He says, take a lamb, this is Passover, a perfect lamb without spot or blemish and offer it. And take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doors of your homes. So Jesus is riding into town. Here's, here's a secret, you'll like this. He is the lamb. And as they are celebrating Passover symbolically, on Friday, he will be crucified exactly at the moment that the Passover lamb is sacrificed. Down to the nanosecond. Why? Because he is the lamb without spot or blemish. God is so exact in what he does. As we look at this, all the prophecies that are unfolding, we need to understand something. Not only did God give them a roadmap to the coming of the Lord, but they also give, him, give a roadmap of the second coming that we have not yet seen. But we are standing in anticipation. Matthew 24, Ezekiel 38, Daniel 7 through 10, all of them point to an understanding. What does it look like before the second coming of Christ? Well, there'll be wars, rumors of wars. There's all kinds of stuff happening. They will be an outpouring of evil like you have never in your life seen. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of old. Um, but something that I've experienced when I was a kid, we prayed in school. I went to a public school, we prayed. But something happened in 1964, they'd done away with prayer. So after that, you had in between 10 to 12 million kids graduate every year that never prayed, that never knew the God that, that some of you know. So over a 60 year period or a 58 year period, you have generation after generation that has returned to become pagans. Them are, that's who Jesus Christ died for. But by the way, I'm chief when it comes to being a pagan. Any people ever come from darkness? I was raised by Dave. And um, Dave was unique. He was a blackout drunk. And, and I watched him cut his arm off trying to drag my mom through a window, 187 stitches to sew it back on. He tried to smother me when I was a kid, but he, he loved me. Um, uh, he brought a guy home with his eye missing and part of his head gone. And another one of his buddies was stabbed 11 times. And so I never went to school because the bars closed at 2.30 in the morning and he'd come home, so you hid. And if he found you, he beat you. 
And so when I fell the first, the third, and the fifth, and was old enough to drive in the seventh, and they asked me to leave in the tenth, I could not read a comic book because I missed on the average about 130 days a year. Then something happened. But I was a product of Dave. So Dave was a womanizer. He, he drank, uh, you know, he smoked dope. He, uh, Dave done everything. And, but something happened. The lamb showed up. And something changed. Now, I never went to church a day. You, you look at me and say, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to say this stuff. I never went to church a day in my life. I was 26 years old, and some guy, I was fishing a tournament. I love to fish and hunt. I was fishing a tournament, and the guy came to me and said, I just want you to know the Lord just wants to show you he's real. You're going to win this tournament tomorrow. And I thought, you idiot. First place was a totally rigged out bass boat. I run off with the tournament and caught every fish that I caught one right after another. God got my attention. The next week, I took a Baptist Sunday school teacher fishing in that new boat, and he led me to the Lord. Now, the guy that couldn't read a comic book, something happened to. God showed up. Now, here's the deal. The reason why Jesus showed up, and he's the lamb that can only do what he can do, is I was broken, I was gooped up, I was perverted, I was addicted. Uh, I could smell Vin Rose on Al 5 and Kroger's when I walked in the door. But Jesus showed up and done something in me that I couldn't do myself. And I remember once I begin to follow Jesus that, that people were standing around holding my beard thinking he'll be back in a second. Had no plans on being a pastor. I had a TV show for several years and fished. And then all of a sudden the Lord said, it's time to go fishing. I haven't looked back. All I can say is you can have the shows, the boats and all that stuff. I'll take Jesus. Because Jesus changed my life. Jesus done what I could not do. I am a free man. Something very unique about this. Not only did he free me up, but over the years, I watched 40 people in my family while I baptized them. And the neat thing is, is as you walk out this door, you'll see a chair in the back. And it's got Dave's name on it. That was my dad. Something happened to him. Jesus showed up and touched him and changed him. I was his pastor. And something happened. See, he was a broken man with a broken life, just like you and I. We come undone. So as we're, we come today and we're celebrating Palm Sunday, we're reflecting on the greatest event that ever took place in history. What does it mean to me and you? The lamb. The lamb took the sin of all of us. Now, every one of us deserved death. We're all guilty. None of us can be saved by merit. If we stood before God, we're hell bound. But the lamb showed up. And because of the lamb and the sacrifice that he made for me, John 3.16, Josh, go get the, the classes. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We're living in a very unique time. You know, there's a lot of people that go to church that don't know Jesus. There's a lot of people that go to church that, that, that doesn't have a relationship and don't know his word. And I want to tell you something. In my experience, sitting and waiting on the Lord, he can do more in five minutes in my life than anything in the world can do. There's not enough stuff 
in the world that can take the place or fix the brokenness in my life or your life. That's why the Lamb showed up. As we celebrate this, we're unfolding Jesus riding into town to fulfill something that was spoken 700 years prior. And it was spoken for them, but it was spoken for you also and for me also. See, we're broken. We can't buy enough. We can't get enough. We can't do enough. There's just something in us. The thing that I've experienced 44 and a half years into this thing is I'm a free man. See, the Bible tells us who the Son has made free is free indeed. And God allows us by through the blood of the Lamb and Jesus Christ giving His life for me. There is no other way. Actually, what the Scripture says, there is no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone that comes to Him comes in, and one of our greatest dilemmas that we have in, in the Christian society is that um, coming to Him means that I'm willing to be all in. Actually, I'm not an altar call guy. So if you're worried about altar calls, I'm not an altar call guy. That's something that was created in the 1800s. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, you need to pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. In the book of Acts, the first sermon preached in the book of Acts, Peter tells people, they ask, what should we do? And Peter simply says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. So what we're doing today, we're baptizing people. Baptism. Baptism is an outward show of what's going on in our hearts. Baptism is, represents the death, burial, and resurrection of our lives. Baptism is an outward show of saying, I am all in. It's like a wedding ring. I said this a few weeks ago to the congregation. To understand baptism is like standing before a preacher that's marrying you, and it comes to that place and that time when you're going to put a ring on and you say, you know what? I really don't care to wear the ring. See, in a relationship, it requires a commitment, an all-in commitment. We're allowed in there by grace and what Jesus Christ did, but we, we're bringing the multitudes in here, we are saved by grace. Baptism, people, you can head to the room. Um, can you guys unplug the heaters and... This is really good. This is life. This is life. What does it, the scripture says this. What does it profit? I want you to think about something. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? What does it profit? And actually, the truth is, We have an opportunity. God has invited you and I to experience something that we could not experience anyplace else. So for the folks that are getting baptized this morning, what they're saying is, is I'm putting the ring on. I'm saved, but I want to show, I want it to be an outward witness of what's going on in my life.
Look at the wall. That's a good problem. Mike, are you in there? <laughs> Glory. Water warm. Yes, it is. It's good. Come on in here, Rick. Stand sideways, Mike. Let's go. Just go that way. Hi, Rick. How are you doing? Morning, sir. Morning. Yeah, you want to move? Oh, you can. Yes. All right. Well, this is uh, my brother, Rick. Um, we've gotten to know each other a little closer through home group, and uh, he. Uh, He's uh, biker trash like I am. We love to ride our motorcycles, and and uh, but just the service that I see that he does for his family. Uh, he puts the Lord first. He puts his family second, and the world comes third. So it's truly an honor uh, to baptize him today. And uh, I just would ask him, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Rick? Yes, sir. And are you ready? to uh, do this to wipe away your sins and to just go ahead and make an example for all of us here today that you're willing to lay down <clears throat> your worldly ways and just accept the life that Christ has led for you. Yes, I am. All right, well, I'm ready to baptize you. And do you want to go forward or back? Backwards. Backwards? Right. All right, backwards. You ready? We're going to do this. But <clears throat> we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This way? Yeah. If you need yeah, it. Yeah. Steps. Right there. There you go. There's towels over there in the corner. Yeah. Tammy. Right there. Turn, Turn around. This way if you there you go. Almost hit your husband's head, so I want to make sure I do this the right way this time. I'm shorter. Okay. Well, this is Tammy. This was Rick's wife, and she's in our home group as well. And uh, it's just been a, a complete joy to have them in our home group and to... Uh, to share and uh, the thing that I've learned most about Tammy is, is she has a heart of Christ mm -hmm. that she wants to do for others before she does for herself, that she thinks of others before she thinks of herself and that she wants to spread the love and the grace that um, Jesus has, has blessed her with. And it's just truly an honor uh, to get to know them, to uh, just have them be part of our life. Um, if you're not involved in a life group, I couldn't suggest it anymore. It's, uh, it's like-minded people, and it's people that you can lean on that can also hold you accountable. So I'm truly honored that you're letting me do this today, that she's, uh, again, making the example for all of us. Tammy, do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. And do you accept the fact that you're going to turn away from worldly ways and just follow the, the path that Christ has led for us? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to <clears throat> we're going to bless you, and we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay.
The Bible doesn't tell us that just pastors baptize. The Bible tells us to make disciples and baptize. So that's life group leaders, family members. Hi there. I know you. Well, for those of you who don't know, this is my beautiful wife, mm -hmm. Tina. And uh, as I was given this opportunity, I thought to myself, this must have been what John felt like baptizing Jesus. This is a lady that made me want to be a better man, to be a better husband, and to choose a life that follows Christ. It was her example. So I truly do feel that this is an honor, that she would allow me to do this, that the example that she set with family and her commitment to God showed me that I was falling way short. So it was through her that I accepted Christ again. I had done it as a child, but she renewed that, that want and that love that I had been missing for so many years. So Tina, I ask you at this time, do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? I do. And do you want to just walk away from worldly ways? I do. So let's set the example. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. This is good stuff. Next. Sam. Hi there. Stand right there. There we go. You stand right there. You can face the group right now. You know, the exciting thing about this is, is um, as we see people come, to Christ and we see family members and Sandy, um, I'm excited, Sandy is baptizing Haley and, and this is a special time. Have you, uh, um, you've been around here for a while now yeah. and to, to come to that place where you made a decision, uh, I'm ready to follow Christ and, and, and put the ring on. And, uh, and it's, a, it's actually an honor for uh, family member to be able to do that. Do you have any questions to ask her? This is an honor. Yes. I love her like she's my own daughter. And I'm proud of her for accepting Jesus. She always loved Jesus, but this is a huge step. So yeah. I love her. Have you received Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Yes. Okay, you turn this way. And we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Come on in, Jake. The water is fine. What's going on, Reese? Stand right there. You're good. Hi, Jake. You know, one of the neat things about this is fathers baptizing their children. You know, there's just a, a, a commitment because basically what's being said is not only this young man is saying, today I'm making a statement, but this father's saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's so important. Do you have anything to ask him? Yeah, um, I just, all I really want to say is how proud of I am of him and uh, he's turned out to be a good young man, a God-fearing man. And uh, I'm just glad that I can be on this journey with him and. Amen. Yeah. So, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
This is good. Is this Jake's sister or Reese's sister? All right. Yeah, that's good. Come on down, the water's fine. Hi, Kelly. This is Riley, and she asked me to baptize her because she wanted to be obedient. That was her her reasoning. She, her I think her words were she wanted to obey God's law, and just that sweet obedience of a of a child to say, I want to do what God has called me to do from the Word of God. So, do you have anything you want to share? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, have you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior to cover you for your sins? Yes. Okay, then it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a lot of wet people back there. It's a good problem. Hi, Bren. I'm doing pretty good. Hi, Sierra. Now, before before you, uh, do you have something to say? Go ahead. Have you met me? Yes. <laughs> he said, "Do you want to talk?" I said, uh, "Yeah." So this is Sierra. This is my um, future sister-in-law. I know. I get super emotional. Just welcome to Bren's life. Um, but I today is going to be the best yes of your life. And I have seen you coming to church and seeing your family change. And I just cannot wait to watch Jesus move in your family. Um, and for everybody, this is an easy yes, but the enemy is going to attack um, because he doesn't like these yeses. So we need to sit in the stillness of him and seek him and look up to him because he is a peace that will pass all understanding. I have a question. You, I talked to you on the phone. Yes, and it was a good talk. A, and, you, and you made a statement. You wanted to make a statement. Well, just that I, um, I've been coming here for a while and that um, just watching everybody and you speak every day really touches me and it makes me a believer in Jesus and Amen. that I want to accept him into my life. Amen. Um, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Great. That's what you're <laughs> Okay, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is good stuff. Next. All right. Hi, Mom. Hi, Colin. I love it when young people come up and they put their name on the list. And we get to talk to them and let the families walk them through the process such an important process. So this is Colin. Um, it's been amazing to see his transformation over the last six to eight months and him finding the Lord. Um, and I just feel so blessed to be his mom. Being a parent is so hard. And so I'm just so thankful that God trusted me to be his mother and to be on this journey with him. I'm so proud of you, buddy. Yeah. Ready to be baptized? Yep. All right. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'd like to share something very simple. It's really easy to look at these people and say, them are little kids, but I. I believe it's important for you to understand that's someone's grandma and someone's grandpa. As we look at what we're doing, we are changing the future and the generations coming up. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Hi, Janet. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Zoe. This is Zoe. <laughs> Zoe is going to be baptized today. Um, she has just run as fast as she can towards everything that Jesus has for her. I got her a Bible and she reads it every night. Is that correct? She asked tons and tons of questions, but she wants to be obedient to do what God calls her to do. Is that right? So um, it's an honor for me to do this. I love these kids, but I want to uh, just take a minute to thank parents. Thank Sandy and Kyle for training their kids, raising their kids up in the Lord. It's so important. We are secondary teachers. You have the command to train them and to teach them the things of the Lord. And they're doing a great job. So I'm excited. Now we're gonna baptize her. Some of her cousins says they hope some of the sass stays in the water. <laughs> but God said that she was fearfully and wonderfully made. God made her just as she is. But as she gives it to Jesus, he'll, he'll take care of that, right? Zoe, have you accepted Jesus into your heart? Yes, do you, definitely. Do you have anything to say? No. Do you have anything to say? I just want to be with God. She just wants to be with God. So, Zoe, have you accepted Jesus into your heart? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's So, scary. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to say this to parents. You have one shot with your children. One shot. And in the culture and the day we live in, to assume that we could get through this culture without Jesus Christ were deceived. Being in a ministry several years, I have had the displeasure of doing the funerals of children. That parent said, you know, we just want them to be able to do what they want to do. And then the torment after that of the parents that had to live through the years. See, children, according to the scripture, are a gift from God to you. That God has blessed you. You have one shot. And the Bible says, raise your children up in the Lord. Actually, the Old Testament tells us when we get up in the morning, we tell them about Jesus. And when we go through the day, we talk about Jesus. And when we lay down at night, we talk about Jesus. And as we raise them, we raise them in truth. And we guard them and we're their covering and we raise them up to the place that they're able to walk in a world that's desperately broken because they have Jesus. I want to thank you today for visiting, but I would really encourage you as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, this is an exciting thing to baptize people. Matter of fact, if anyone else wants baptized, we have spare clothes back here. We do. This is the greatest event in people's lives to come to that place that says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We have a Good Friday service, two Good Friday services, and then Easter celebration service. If you're not familiar with what we're doing, I would invite you to come to them. There's no gimmicks. There's no tricks, it's just Jesus. 
the greatest name in the world. See, the Bible tells us one day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we just are so thankful for the opportunity to be able to be a part of this, be a part of families that are celebrating the baptism of their family members and their children. And Father, as we gather together, I just pray by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would touch everyone sitting here. Father, that you would, uh, you would stir in them the need for you. And Lord, we just thank you for this celebration day. We thank you for Passover and the Passover lamb. I pray a blessing on the church in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much.